Okay. Uh, hello, my name is David Karp, and I am having a quick conversation with restorative justice uh, facilitators and trainers, Duke, uh, Duke Fisher and Tony McMurphy. And we're talking about using restorative justice for faculty misconduct cases in higher education. So thank you, Duke and Tony. Uh, this has been a lot of your work recently. So can you give us a, a sense of what kinds of cases you're getting? Would love to. It's been actually um, really fascinating because we are often hearing from communities in crisis. It could be impacting an entire institution, sometimes a department, and people are struggling with what, how do we navigate this in terms of relationships, communication, when the media is involved, it gets particularly messy. If there are legal things happening in the background, it's hard on everyone. We often are invited into communities that they themselves would express would be utterly broken. They don't know how to function with each other. Uh, things that have been uh, normal procedure don't seem to work. Scheduling classes around uh, folks who, who have been the target of accusations, staff members don't know What's the determination of the process? How do I feel phone calls from parents who say, Are my, is my daughter safe uh, in the classroom? Um, and folks not uh, comfortable or understanding how to behave around each other. We have several incidents, incidences where folks um, are actively shunning each other um, and they don't know how to, to balance that space. Uh, whether you greet someone in the cafeteria or the hallway, uh, whether or not you field questions from someone at a faculty meeting or at a presentation. I mean, uh, very high levels of questions and folks not knowing how to behave and how to be in each other's space. And what's, what's unique about a uh, restorative approach uh, compared to a more traditional investigation process? Uh, why are people finding value in this approach? Well, the way I would answer that is that often um, folks are dissatisfied with the standard menu of what's available to them for response. And I think most of that is circled around that restorative justice is uniquely positioned to help people respond to their experience. And their experience is often one of uh, feelings and of harm. And so the restorative justice process uh, tries to put nuance to how they're feeling and how they're experiencing that harm and then plan actions based on that. Often responses from other systems, counseling centers, uh, HR responses may have different uh, goals in mind, um, including the goal of protecting the institution. And folks are very aware um, when uh, strategies are designed to protect the institution versus addressing the way they're experiencing harm. I think I would add to um, uh, what I know of this is like student cases, there's so much uh, community collateral harm. Uh, much of this is playing out on social media. It's very public. It's not as if it's a quiet, private investigation happening in the background. It's very much a, a public experience that everybody's navigating. The other thing that I think um, a restorative response offers is it's experientially, it's very different than a traditional path in that people come and they have the space to express very openly without filters what their experience, their concerns, their harms are. People listen to each other differently and the quality of the collaboration that emerges from that experience um, has a way of impacting a community where they come together and in Really, from our experience, we often see good things emerging from messes. So I, I know you can't talk about individual cases because of confidentiality, but uh, just thinking in a general sense um, about these cases, uh, can you walk us through the stages of a restorative process? What's, what's the first thing that you do when you land on a campus or, or get an invitation? Yes, so when we land, the first thing that we are committed to doing is looking through the eyes of the key stakeholders to understand what their experience is. 
I often use the metaphor of we're working a puzzle and everyone comes with their handful of pieces and dumps it on the table. And that allows us to understand the lay of the land. From there, we go often um, into reporting back. We think it's important to have an internal steering committee that understands the culture of the institution. So we're reporting back, collaborating with them. From there, we go into training. Well, so it's- Hold on, hold on. <laughs> um, yeah. so, uh, so the first stage is, um, you said looking through the lens of the individual stakeholders. So that means- Individual interviews, you want me to- Individual interviews. Yeah. Um, and okay. they're, okay, got it. So step one is individual meetings. Okay. Uh, and I think, I I think people that. are, they're generally surprised at the tenure of a, or the tone of those individual meetings. That often uh, it's very private space and we allow people to talk about how they're experiencing the situation. And those questions are very different than the questions that they've probably answered related to an investigation. And we tr quickly try to build uh, comfort and trust so that folks can talk about what has been hardest from their experience of the situation. And they talk about many things, David. They talk about um, how difficult it is to manage the department, but they also talk about how difficult it is at their uh, dinner tables at home when they have to answer questions from their spouses and their children because they're seeing it often play out on social media or even on the national media. And so those, those individual um, interviews lay a very important groundwork that people begin to understand the nature of the process. And that is, what is your experience? What's been hardest about this? And we're gonna use that as the starting point to plan any action that comes next. And then you, Tony, we're about to say training was next. So how does that fit in? Yes, so people want to understand what RJ is, uh, how it's different from more traditional ways of responding to harm or incidents on campus. So those include introductory sessions where uh, often people, we're talking about the principles of restorative justice. We're giving people an experience of being in circle so they understand what it is. We use circles to teach circles. And then by the time they get into harm circles, there's a comfort level. There's an understanding. And often I would say there's actually a desire because so many people yearn for more authentic space that they don't easily find on campuses. So the training's a safe way for them to get introduced to the concept without having to talk about the incident specifically. Exactly. Yeah. One, one of the more common training experiences that we have is while we're teaching them about circles, we may open up for them to talk about general concerns around campus climate. And so folks then can start to share at broad levels um, what's been difficult for them. And so the idea is for them to practice and use circles before they need circles. Like they, be, they begin to build comfort with that so that when uh, an issue occurs, they're not trying to do both things at the same time, learn how to circle, and then also address these difficult elements that they have already have one checked off. I know what it's like to speak from my heart. I know what it's like to lead with my humanity. Um, and I know how I will be treated in circle. And then we only have a couple minutes left. So um, then uh, what's the next stage? So that would be um, grouping by affinity circles. And generally what that is, it's where people get to get together and talk about what's been difficult. Um, in many uh, instances with accusations, people are surprised to hear that they have similar experience, that this isn't just individuals struggling with an accusation, but it's something that more broadly um, impacts the community. And so there's um, a nuancing of harm that um, it's, it happens both at the individual level and at the institutional level or the organizational level as well. And, and what do you mean by affinity groups? Um, it's folks who share similar concerns or similar, similar experiences, folks um, that are willing to say, it's been difficult for me to navigate this. A powerful example um, at one institution that we've been partnering with 
is that we convened a gender circle in the context of Me Too. So we gathered um, as a large group and then we separated uh, male identifying participants and female identifying participants to talk about the actual experience on campus. Um, so for example, to hear men say in safe space where they can be brave that I have to think about whether I'm gonna leave my door open when I'm with a female student, because if I close it, what assumptions might be made? Uh, where we can hear females talk about what it's like to be on campus, where they feel that they're not respected for what they know or the expertise they have sometimes, um, that it's more how they look and what people want from them. And the, um, so, and, and I, I, as I know from your work, uh, you also organize by other dimensions as well, like just gatherings of graduate students or postdocs or faculty or administrators uh, as, that, uh, as that forms. And then after the affinity circles, what's the next step? Well, we, we talk often that harm is the compass um, of our interventions. And so we pretty quickly will see where people need to meet with each other to address harm between them. And the idea, David, is if we can support them to name the harms that they've experienced, understand the unmet needs that are created by those harm situations, especially between individuals, and this is often in smaller group, uh, then people will be prepared to problem solve together, that they have to address personally with each other how they've been impacted or how they've been harmed, how they've been harmed by each other. And it's that very personal work that then stages them to do the next piece, which is problem solving on a broader basis. And it's where people feel like that they've cleared enough um, of the debris between them that they can take on tougher issues like gender or comfort or bias awareness on campus. Uh, that's great. Um, anything else either of you would add uh, to um, as, a, as a closing takeaway for this process? Well, I um, am always struck by the transformative nature of the work. And the things that I think about are um, actual things that people say. Like we had a faculty member say recently, I've been a faculty member for 40 years, and this is the most meaningful conversation and meeting I've ever engaged in. Where we have people say things so honestly about um, my children now look at me differently. They see me as a different human being because how I've been portrayed. We had two faculty members who hadn't spoken to one another for three years. And uh, when we met them, the one said, no way, not gonna sit in a room with him no matter what. And they engaged in dialogue together for nearly four hours all together in a couple of sessions. And they shifted the relationship and how they see one another and opened up new possibilities. That's great. Okay, well, we're gonna close it there. So thank you both so much for sharing this work. Thank you, thank David. You.